old and a full stack engineer. And this talk will dive into accelerated mobile pages, otherwise known as AMP, um, which is an open source library for building fast mobile experiences. So here's Lisa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be speaking at Sustainable UX this year. And yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing more about AMP with you. So a little bit of roadmap today. We'll go through some of the trends of internet use, and I'll go into a bit of detail explaining what the AMP project is about. And we'll tackle three current mobile challenges and how those link to sustainable sustainability issues such as climate change, social inclusion, and social inequality. And finally, we, if we have enough time, <laughs> I'll go through a code run through. I have recorded videos, but I think we'll just do a live demo where I can go through a repo with you. And all the links are listed. So if you'd like to follow along, the slides are on Bitly Sustainable UX, as shown here on the cover screen. That's the original keynote where if you are able to download it, there will be actual videos embedded within it. All right, let's get started. So I think while the internet is fantastic and we all use it every day, a lot of the time as developers, we may not be aware of some of the challenges our users may be facing, especially users who are not necessarily in our target market. So for example, I'm currently based in Mount View in Silicon Valley. And if you're not developing apps for emerging markets, such as countries within Africa or in Southeast Asia, you may not be aware of some of their bandwidth limitations. And I think here, just looking at some of these headlines, it's quite clear that there are negative impacts of internet on anything from climate change to inclusion to social equality. So it's my belief that AMP has given some of this power back and AMP can actually help to alleviate some of these issues. And we'll go through them, pairing them up with the mobile web challenges coming up. All right, so hello. <laughs> I'm originally a financial analyst turned digital marketer and now full stack engineer. Graduated from the Flat School, Flatiron School, Code School. And for me, I have lived in, throughout three different continents. I was born in Taiwan, but I have worked extensively in South Africa and now back in the US. So I have experience using basic Android phones as well as buying data, literally by megabytes on a month to month basis. So I think that gives me some unique perspective into how apps work in a emerging market as well as on phones. They may be different from what we experience as developers from day to day. All right, so let's start with some macro trends. In October 2016, this is the first time where mobile page views have extended or overtaken desktop for the first time. And in March of last year, Android device pages views have actually overtaken Windows. I think this is quite significant because when you think about a traditional workplace where a lot of companies still have desktop computers, they're most likely running on Windows or Mac, but the fact that there's even more Android device page views shows that there is definitely a momentum in the direction of viewing and working on mobile and not just on a desktop. And in many ways, performance does equal to money, right? If you speak with your product team or your business teams, you hear a lot about how do we tweak performance? How do we decrease our page loads? And I'll encourage you to check out WPO stats. They have a lot of great case studies. And if we look at Google, they ran an experiment earlier sometime in the last two years where it actually increased page load time by 800 milliseconds. And in this time, they were hoping to load more page search results on the page. And just with this minor tweak where they increased their load time, they actually saw um, a million dollar daily revenue loss. So this is a loss as a result of 800 millisecond increase, right? And if we look at, for example, AliExpress, that's based out of China, they decreased their load time by 36% and actually saw an increase in the amount of orders received. And we'll talk about that later, how this makes a huge difference as far as your know, access to the market, as well as for users in these emerging markets where they're able to maybe get on websites or mobile apps where they traditionally could not have access to. So what is AMP? AMP, if you haven't heard of it before, it's an open source framework with the goal or a mission to build really fast mobile pages. And it would almost be instant loading mobile pages where the average load time is less than two seconds. 
Um, I have actually just updated my slides because the AMP conference just happened, took place in Amsterdam over the last two days. And there's a lot of great information on their Twitter handle and on their website. I believe they recorded and live stream all the sessions. So if you're interested, I'll highly encourage you to take a look. But as of the stats announced yesterday, there's now over 5 billion AMP power pages running in the wild, spread across over 31 million domains and 100 plus languages. So the big announcement last year at Google I.O. was that Google Mobile Search is now the AMP top stories carousel. And it's a global rollout where if you are visiting Google on your phone, you will see that AMP stories carousel. And for this year, sorry, that's a typo, February 2018, They've just announced that AMP will be integrated into Gmail, where you can enable JavaScript within a Gmail client and your users are able to perform more dynamic functions within <laughs> their email. For example, RSVP to events, placing an order. They showed examples from Pinterest where you're able to pin images directly within your email or booking.com where you can search for hotels based on you know your travel date as well as your preferred city and actually view the property detail all within your gmail so you don't have to contact switch and you don't actually have to leave your email and visit booking.com's web app or booking.com's actual mobile app so that's really powerful right on the right i had a video that was going to show oops oh dear Sorry, I should put it on Do Not Disturb. Um, on the right, I had a video that was going to display um, all the information on AMP Carousel, but since we can't have video on here, again, I highly encourage you to check out the slides. So what are some of the content platforms that's enabling AMP? Well, most of the big ones that you'll probably recognize, you know, Facebook, Twitter, WordPress, Google, Pinterest, LinkedIn. And what this means is that when your content or when your web app is optimized using AMP, you immediately reap the benefit when you post or when your content is shared across these different platforms, especially with WordPress, where it's user generated, user powered. You can imagine how that will escalate as people are sharing your content on their personal websites and you still get that instant load benefit coming out of AMP. Um, as you can see here on the right, there's underneath the image, you see techcrunch.com and there's a tiny little light bulb image. That's a sign that this is an AMP page and it's optimized in this case within the LinkedIn app, right? The media AMP load time from Google search is less than 0.5 seconds. And we'll talk a little more later about how AMP or how Google cache enables this really minimal load time. All right, who is publishing with AMP today? There's a lot more companies coming all the time, but I figure I'll pick a selection of brands or company names that everyone will probably recognize. So you see the Airbnb, you see eBay, 1-800-Flowers. I believe AliExpress, again, is in China. And Macari is a new shopping mobile app idea. Rakuten is based in Japan, so that's another e-commerce website that's huge there. And again, this was the announcement from last year where Google at Google I.O. in May, they mentioned that in your past experience dealing with AMP, you probably notice a lot of static content. So pages that's shared on news publishers such as Huffington Post, New York Times, and their focus on the roadmap was to have more interactive content where the idea is to optimize it for things like e-commerce, for travel, for retail. And they also outline some of the ideas they have for transitioning from AMP page to progressive web apps. And in the latest one, they currently have um, dis discussed that in a conference this year where they showed wonderful case studies of how, again, companies like Booking.com and companies like AliExpress has really used the AMP power to transition to a progressive web app, even on just a mobile, sorry, just on a web app. So one single code base that can be used and optimized for mobile. We'll tackle some of the th mobile web challenges. So there are three. Firstly, most devices are not very powerful and cellular networks can actually make connections quite slowly. Finally, JavaScript is doing all the heavy lifting. So as you can see, the first challenge, most of the devices our end users are using to view our web apps or our web pages are not as powerful as the phone's UI may have in our pocket as developers, right? 
a lot of times as developers who are testing some of the newest machine on some of the newest models, whether that be an iPhone or the Samsung or any of the new Macs. However, as you can see here, there are a couple brands. Sorry, I am going to try to turn this on. Do not disturb. Um, how, okay. Okay, oh dear. All right, let's hope that, oops, I'm sorry about the notification. Hopefully they'll disappear. So some of the brands you recognize here, Apple, Samsung, and on the right, you might not have seen these ones as much. For example, Xiaomi from China, Huawei, Taiwan, the BlackBerry, but also Micromax and Oppo and Vivo. Some of these are manufacturers that's dedicated to creating lower end budget phones or budget devices for emerging markets, where a phone may cost as little as 50 US dollars for one phone. And these phones have to satisfy the need of local users as well. So it's not just for basic texting or basic calls, but some of the users will actually be doing things like watching YouTube videos and shopping and conducting any of those activities we typically do on their phones. And for these underpowered devices, what is causing the slow? What is slowing down their performance? Well, a lot of web apps or web websites use really complex CSS animations. And whenever your, your viewers are looking at the video, whether that be an ad or a YouTube video promotion, there's a lot of data download and processing, right? Any of the background processes, such as push notifications or tracking your user's location on GPS, is constantly chewing up data and it's constantly chewing up battery power. So on some of the lower end phones, where they are on lower operation models or even using Opera to view, it would dramatically slow down the experience. And that's where you get the overheating of the phones. Here's a case study where if we were looking at the right, the code pen, you will actually show they display CSS animation with two methods. Firstly, they will animate the white ball on the left of the screen on to the right by iteratively setting the left position. And if we were able to watch the video, you see that it triggers re-layout calculations and it's actually really janky. It's slowly moving across the screen and in the end, it actually takes the title, CSS animation left versus translate off the screen. So this experience is never desirable. You don't want your users to have to experience janky animations. And the reason why that's happening is with methods such as setting the left position is causing all five stages. So with your JavaScript, you are changing the style and layout, causing a repaint and recomposition on the screen. Whereas the other option is to use the CSS animation transform translate X. And if we were able to see the video, you see that the ball is moving across the screen from left to right much more smoothly and is not taking the title off the screen with you. Why is that? It's because with CSS animation such as transform, it is GPU optimized and it skips two of the five stages. In this case, you're, not, you're using JavaScript downloading JavaScript, and then you download your CSS style sheet. And because transform is a CSS transformation, you don't have to re-lay out the page. You don't have to repaint the page. It's simply recompositing. So you're skipping two out of the five steps. And most of our underpowered devices, the AMP approach is to limit that. Right, so how AMP deal with the issue of resolving some of the underpowered device is they're limiting a subset of CSS where they're only allowing GPU accelerated properties such as transform or setting opacity. And you only allow a maximum of 50 kilobytes of total CSS. So if you are having experience using preprocessors such as SAS, you can still use those, but before you integrate it, you have to download the minified version and make sure you compile your SAS style sheets into CSS. In fact, I know Chris Epstein at SAS, their team, the core team is working on having a, almost a tree shaking methodology where they're able to parse through and pre-compile your code, determine what CSS functions or CSS definitions are not in use and actually remove that from your code file. So in questions or in doubt, just make sure you check cssstriggers.com where you are able to see which files, or sorry, I mean, which functions are limited to just these three, JavaScript, style, and composite. 
Amp also has custom components. If you are familiar with React, you're probably used to building modules and components. Oh dear. Okay, so we will pre-calculate an initial viewport layout with AMP image. How they achieve this is by defining a height and width. So what this allows is when your web page is loaded on that mobile phone for the very first time, AMP is able to pre-calculate what the viewport will look like, i.e. How, how high is the text, for example, your H1, H2 tags, and how high is the first image or your hero image that typically shows up on first load, right? You can include placeholders and a fallback, so in case your server is down and that image can't be served up, you can actually depict or decide what the placeholder should be. Maybe it'll be a text, maybe it's a gray image, just so that your users are getting the feedback, knowing that, no, we should not be getting any sort of data because unfortunately our server is down at the moment. The second challenge is that cellular networks makes connections a lot more slowly, right? So it's slow to initiate network connections and when you're on your phone, when you're on the mobile network, requests are even more expensive and it's even slower. So for example, oops, for example, on a typical 2G connection, it will take about 300 to 1000 milliseconds just to establish an initial network connection. On the 3G network, it will be a little faster, so 100 to 300 milliseconds. On the 4G network, where it's great, it's really fast. It only takes about 10 to 100 milliseconds. If you're familiar with networking and how telecom works, there's a TCP IP protocol, which you have to resolve, establish that security handshake in order to make a secure connection to your web page, especially if the user is visiting your website for the very first time. So in, in a mobile page, or actually looking at mobile versus web, 50% of pages have more than 76 requests. These are external assets where your user have to fetch on their first connection, first visit to your website, actually retrieve this data. So if you think about it, if you're using a style sheet, if you have external images, if you're using custom fonts, if you're downloading JavaScript, where you have to download the React framework, and in addition to that, once you get it, you're parsing through the data. Over 76 requests before a meaningful first paint happens on your user screen. That's pretty scary, right? And we'll look at a case study with Adobe. This was a video, so I've done some screenshots. We did the test from Dallas VA on a good 2G speed on something that's a mid-tier phone, a Motorola G Gen 4. You'll see that from zero to 18.5 seconds, it was blank screen. If you see here, it was white, i.e. the user had to wait for 18 seconds before they see anything that shows up on their phone. And if you think to your personal habits, how long are you willing to wait before you skip out and actually just choose to navigate to another web page? Right, so at 18.5 to 19 seconds, you, we can see that a header image is slowly downloading, it's coming out. And then it actually took up to 37 seconds for that back image completely loaded, right? You see the background of red, blue, and gray. However, the text disappeared. What happened here? You see that loading of waiting, waiting for platform? What happened here was that you probably had a custom web font. And now the server is going, or your user is going to fetch that web font again. And because of that, all the texts have disappeared. So your user had to wait for 37 seconds. Now they are beginning to read or beginning to scroll through your page. And all of a sudden, nothing happened. Everything's gone. So it took from 37 to 48.5 seconds before your text came back. And at this point, all right, your user is able to view the website again. But you see at 50 seconds, there was a re-layout, right? Your title went from three lines to two lines. Another custom web font probably loaded at this moment. And you see this a lot, for example, with advertisements. When you loaded a page, all of a sudden it's reshuffling, you're moving, you're pushed down, you're pushed up. And that is because images up top or adverts or iframes are popping up and that's pushing contents around. That's a really janky experience and you don't want your users have to go through that. 
So how AMP approached this is by inlining the CSS style sheet. Instead of having it as an external sheet where the user have to make that extra step of requesting, downloading, and parsing, this ensures that when HTML lands, there's CSS within it, and there's a meaningful first paint. Your mobile page is ready for basic use. Your users can begin to scroll through, and they can begin to see the content on it, as opposed to on the left in single page app, where you download the HTML, and you have to make a second step of downloading CSS. And finally, your JavaScript file has downloaded. And then you see something meaningful on the page, such as the Adobe example we saw earlier, where it took up to 37 seconds before that first content appeared. Another AMP's approach is to prioritize resource loading. Earlier on, we spoke about AMP modules or AMP components, where, for example, for an image where you have to define the height and the width of your image, right? So with the AMP, um, resource, they actually control a network request to prioritize resource effectively. When you're looking at your user visiting a web page for the first time, what's appearing in their viewport or appearing on their phone, that's the first width and height that's required. Oh, it's known as above the, above the fold. So in this case, the AMP runtime will prioritize any images or titles or font that needs to be downloaded and ensure that those are fetched first. And while your user is looking through, right, reading the page from the top, AMP runtime is going through and prefetching any resource that's needed further down. For example, if you have ads or if you have videos or even more images later down. And once the user begins to scroll, they are beginning to move through the mobile phone and looking at contents that's lower, these resources are lazily loaded as late as possible. And how this translates is that CPU is only used when the resources are actually shown to users. You're not downloading and loading everything at the same time. In fact, your users may or may not get to the end of the page. So there's no point rendering those images on the viewport when your users may never get there. Right? So this helps to conserve some of their CPU power and obviously conserve their battery power as well. Another AMP approach is by having AMP cache. So we're wondering what's this magic? Why is AMP able to load within two seconds? Well, it's because there's external caching methods from both hosted both by the Google domain as well as popular third parties such as Cloudflare. Right? So what happens when your users are visiting your page for the first time is that they have to establish that secure connection, make the SSL handshake, and resolve all that before they can even visit your page. However, if your end pages are cached on Google or Cloudflare, that means any users who have visited websites that's powered by Google or, uh, or powered by Cloudflare before, they've already resolved that DNS resolution, right? They've already established that SSL handshake. They trust Google.com because they visited Google.com before, or they trust Cloudflare because they've downloaded or visited other web page where assets were stored on Cloudflare. And with these CDNs, that's what allows that really quick instant load because it saves on the overhead of establishing those connections. So in the case of the Guardian, on the left is what you see by visiting their web page, and on the right, it's an AMP page. So you see here that it will say theguardian.com on the left, whereas the URL on the right says google.com slash, it will say slash AMP slash the Guardian. But they do still display almost identical image, right? You still have the Guardian header, you still have the menu bar, you don't have the gray menu bar that displayed World Europe US, but you still have a hero image, you still have the title, the summary, et cetera, et cetera. So as far as a user is concerned, it's not that different than experience visiting your web page directly or visiting through AMP. And you can still maintain a lot of branding so the user knows where they are visiting. So the third challenge is JavaScript doing all the heavy lifting. You'll probably recognize most of these frameworks. They're all very popular. So going anywhere from Vue to the left, Ember, Aurelia, Angular, and um, I think now Meteor.js and React, they are all getting quite popular. So why is JavaScript slowing down a web app? That is because typically when you're downloading a web app or downloading HTML, 
It's using synchronous JavaScript, which means that as it's parsing your HTML page, once it's downloaded, anytime it hits an external link, or one of those external requests we talk about, it will need to pause the parsing, go off, download that resource, whether it be an external style sheet or a custom web font or an image, come back and continue parsing through the page. So parsing your HTML takes time, going offsite and downloading external resources takes time. And when you download a JavaScript framework, such as an Ember runtime or a React, that takes additional time where you have to parse through the downloaded JavaScript, depending on the code size of the connection they are on. And only when they have parsed through all these information and loaded your JavaScript, are they able to start interacting with your site and having any of the dynamic functions. So some developers are looking into server-side rendering, which aims to help resolve this issue and make JavaScript not that slow. But it is really complex to get right. With server-side rendering, there's a, diff a lot of different tweaking you have to do. And it may actually take more time to understand that and optimize that versus building web apps the conventional way. So how AMP approached this is by switching the tag from synchronous JavaScript to async JavaScript loading. And this keeps any external resources off the critical path. For example, whenever a user is downloading a page and they hit a script tag within the HTML, instead of pausing, going offsite to download it, bringing it back, parsing it, it will actually have a thread running on in the background um, at the same time where it's downloading. But you can continue to parse the HTML and render the page or paint the page as needed. Right. The second thing it does, it will sandbox any third party JavaScript in a, or in cross domain iframes. And this is also done asynchronously. Again, for example, if you have a pop-up form or if you have some sort of, let's see, advertisements that's in a iframe box, instead of it being able to change the layout of your page or actually shuffle things around, it will be sandbox within that iframe. So you have a predefined height and width, and you will block any form submission or execution so that you can't allow any of these third parties to impact how your web app actually performs. So as a recap, um, the mobile web challenges we face today, especially for emerging markets, are that most devices are not very powerful. So we need to keep that in mind as we're choosing things such as using CSS transform versus using JavaScript to achieve animation. Cellular networks make connections quite slowly. So if you are on an on the bus, if you're commuting, or if you're in an area with high traffic, it will take even longer for a user visiting your page or mobile to access that information. And finally, JavaScript is doing all the heavy lifting. So making sure you use asynchronous JavaScript and sandboxing any data that will cause a reshuffling, repaint, or recompositing of your page. Some people have discussed whether you should AMP or not to AMP, and this can cause some controversy. So for example, one point some developers build is that they feel they're locked into a Google ecosystem. And in my, I, in my thought is, if you're developing VR games for Steam, or if you're developing mobile apps to be on the Google Play platform or to be on the iOS um, app, work marketplace, you are already locked into an ecosystem, right? If you want your app to be discovered on these places, you need to play by their rules. So I don't think AMP is any different in that sense. And again, some users or business folks are concerned about direct traffic versus going through via Google Cache. As I showed you in The Guardian earlier on, you'll be visiting google.com slash AMP instead of theguardian.com. But again, your branding is similar. So for your user, that end experience is not that different. And finally, limited analytics data. As of last count, AMP has over 34 analytics platform. That's all the big ones, such as Nielsen or any of your ad, um, ad calculation, ad data matrix platforms. So that's no longer a limitation. And in fact, there's over 10,500 developers who are engaged with AMP. And in, again, yesterday's announcement, they have seen now that over 80% of AMP contributors are not Google employees. So these are people who are from outside companies, such as Airbnb or eBay, who's implementing AMP in their web app. 
right? And there's plenty of code to support that. So now we are running short on time. I only have about five minutes to go through a, a live coding session, but I think what we'll do is we'll just pull it up real quick. So if you go to this bit.ly link, amp-corgi-repo, you will be able to download the code. And let me see where it is. This is what it will look like, and you'll be able to go through the code. So I just have that pulled up here, here. So as you can see here in the file, it's pretty straightforward. I just have some of my image cached, which is the image of the corgis, because we're building a corgi adoption app, and some of the data in JSON for each dog to have some basic attributes, such as name and gender, and then with AMP. So as you can see with AMP, there's some boilerplate. So the first difference is with HTML, you just have to specify it's an AMP page, right? And then within the head, you still have to define your meta, your link, where the canonical URL is the true source of your URL. For example, if you spend the effort of building a progressive web app, a full-on progressive web app, you still want users to be able to gain the benefit of having all the dynamic functions. So you can think of AMP as a way to discover your company, such as landing on a landing page or content pages. But by the time they arrive, by linking canonical URL to your full-fledged PWA, the second time they visit, it will immediately transition to visiting their PWA. And here you have a link. Oh, this is just my font. But here you also have an AMP boilerplate, which you have to include within your head. Right, So this you can just download very easily from the AMP page. And as we talk about how there's inlining CSS, so with here, let me try to make this bigger. Yeah, so here you have the inlining CSS where you have style and you just have to define AMP custom. And you can see here I have a very small style sheet. So this is what it looks like, an AMP style. And it's the usual, you define H1, H2, et cetera. And for here, you have all the, so this is the AMP runtime script, and you can see that it's asynchronous. So it allows any of the download to parse through your HTML without pausing to download these external scripts. And with the component, such as the image I spoke of, you will just download again, copy and paste the script detail from the AMP web page for things such as a YouTube viewer, a light box effect, a social share, a sidebar, et cetera. So you can start here in my body. You can actually go through the code and see it's not that different. So for example, if we look at YouTube, right? You're able to open and close the tag with AMP YouTube, determine that the layout is responsive, and here you just include the data of the video ID, the width and the height of the YouTube player. And then in the images, you can show that there's different, um, again, different data that's going on here, where on tap, you're able to open up the light box impact, and you have some Arias accessibility details here, such as the tab index and alternative text and title. And then within the social buttons, it's really simple. Once you add and close with AMP social, here, div class, so you have AMP social share, and you can just define the type, such as an email or Facebook, and that will give you the icon immediately showing your standard email Twitter logo. And here you can actually pre-populate with some of the data. So if we go back here, oh, you can't really see it. Let me see if I can start it up real quick. So at this moment, I can't serve it up local directly. But if you're able to download it, you can actually go online and, again, play with the repo or go directly to the M project websites here with M project. They have a lot of really useful case studies you're able to follow and great docs as well. You can even follow tutorials to creating your first M pages. And they are fantastic as far as experimenting it and um, just trying out different source. So I did have a whole different section on how AMP can contribute or lead into your progressive web app. But since we're running out of time, again, <laughs> I would highly encourage going to download the script. And you can just look through my deck or look through my slides and see some of the demonstration of the three paths that AMP proposes to integrate with PWA, whether it be with features, entry points, or as a data so source. 
Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, it was a little rushed today and for the phone calls as well as the alerts that were coming in. But I hope you learned a little bit about AMP today and that you're looking to exploring, actually building your first AMP, um, first AMP app. Thank you.